Hello and welcome back to another episode. In this video I'm gonna review the Vectrex video game system. And let's go! Before I'm gonna tell you the story slash the history of the Vectrex, I thought first I'm gonna tell you what the Vectrex actually is. The Vectrex is the world's first and only vector graphic home video game system that has already a 9 inch black and white monitor built into the system. Vector graphics are basically graphics that consist out of lines instead of the standard raster scan graphics which consist out of pixels. Uh, Advantages of vector graphics are super sharp graphics and the ability to rotate and zoom objects, which can be used for pseudo 3D graphics. But the major drawbacks of vector graphics are number one, the graphics themselves can't be very detailed since there is a limitation on how many lines can be displayed at the same time. And the second big drawback of vector graphics are lack of color and yeah vector graphics became popular in the arcades in the late 70s and early 80s two of the best known vector graphic arcade games are star wars from atari also known as star wars the arcade game and tempest also from atari and beside the monitor which is built in vertical like also in many arcade cabinets of the late 70s and early 80s the Vectrex has also a game built into the system called Mindstorm which is a very good clone slash variation of a popular arcade game called Asteroids and the controller of the Vectrex which resembles the controls of a uh, of an arcade cabinet slash an arcade stick if you want to call it has an actual um, analog joystick which is also very uncommon uh, especially for a video game system from the early 80s and most of the games that were released for the Vectrex were conversions of popular arcade games so you might already notice there's a theme going on with the Vectrex, which is no coincidence because the very first prototype of the Vectrex was called Mini Arcades. And the idea of the developers was to create a battery powered vector graphic handheld slash tabletop system that allows you to play arcade games at home or maybe even on the go depending on the size of the final product. And yeah, this brings me now to the history of the Vectrex. The very first prototype of the Vectrex slash the mini arcade as it was called at that time was developed in late 1980 and early 1981 by a company called Western Technologies. Jay Smith, head of the company and also of Smith Engineering was one of the main designers of the mini arcade slash the Vectrex. He was also the creator of the handheld system Microvision from the year 1979 and this was the very first handheld system worldwide with interchangeable games and yeah he is also known today as the father of the Vectrex and with the very first working prototype of the mini arcade which had a 5 inch black and white vector monitor at that time he went to a company called Kenner, a toy company which is best known for making Star Wars action figures and at that time Western Technologies and Kenner had done some business before That's, that was the main reason why Jay, um, yeah, Jay Smith 
went to Kenner to show his new idea of a video game system. And in the end, Kenner was impressed and uh, yeah, was impressed of the mini arcade. And uh, yeah, in the end, they decided that Kenna wants uh, wanted to help Western Technologies to create uh, a final product of the mini arcade and later on to distribute the system. But only a couple of months later, Kenna cancelled the complete deal since they yeah came to realize that as a toy company they didn't want to jump in into the video gaming market. So the mini arcade went back to Western Technologies, but only to be discovered a few weeks later by Ed Krakauer. He was the CEO of General Consumer Electronics. And Ed Krakauer and Jay Smith had a business meeting because Western Technologies made at that time the fluid for the LCD screens of GCE's um, Game Time, Sports Time and Arcade Time Risk Watch, which, uh, which also have four games built into those uh, yeah, risk watches. And while they had this business meeting, uh, Ed Krakauer noticed the mini arcade and then they talked about the mini arcade and in the end uh, this meeting led to the decision that GCE is going to license and distribute the mini arcade but only after some slight changes uh, were done to the system and yeah the biggest change that was made to the system was to replace the 5 inch vector monitor with a 9 inch vector monitor because in Ed Krakow's opinion it would be very hard for the consumers to accept the final retail price which I can only guess was somewhere between yeah 120 to 200 US dollars um, because they would have to pay a lot of money for a very small device and if the device was bigger slash the screen was bigger it would be easier to justify the high retail price and it might sound strange to us today uh, the decision of uh, at Krakow but in the end it was very normal, especially in the 80s, because it was for the most part the mentality of the electronic industry. And yeah, it still exists in some form today. And that mentality was that there is some kind of a relationship between the size of a device and its retail price. So a big device has a lot of parts in it, therefore it has or therefore it is justified to have a, a high retail price. A smaller device has fewer parts in it, therefore it has to be cheaper. Exceptions were made if smaller devices were used as portable devices. So for example, a big, uh, a big screen TV has a high retail price. A small screen TV has a small retail price, except it is a portable TV, then it can also have a high retail price. Not only the industry fought, fought like that, also a lot of uh, consumers slash customers because there were a lot of market studies that showed that consumers fought, uh, fought like that the same way. And uh, yeah, mostly because of that, some uh, video game systems were actually made a lot bigger than they yeah, then they actually had to be. Uh, for example, the Nintendo Entertainment System, for instance, is twice as big as the original Nintendo Famicom slash the Japanese version of the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. The Atari Lynx uh, is also a perfect example. It, the um, system could have been made a lot smaller, but in the end they decided to make it a lot bigger than it had to be because of this mentality and also the Microvision from Milton Bradley slash the system that Jay Smith invented could have also be made a lot smaller but they changed or they uh, stuck with this size because they thought it would justify the retail price. But after all the changes were done to the system and after a couple of name changes 
The GCE Vectrix arcade system was introduced to the audience of the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago in June 1982 along with 12 games and it was released in November of the same year in North America for a retail price of 199 US dollars. Thanks to the Christmas business, the Vectrix had a very good start and sold pretty good in the first couple of months, which didn't went unnoticed because the board game company Milton Bradley saw the success of the Vectrex and also the potential of the system and bought General Consumer Electronics. But instead of renaming the company General Consumer Electronics or uh, making any major changes inside the company or on the console or anything, uh, Milton Bradley left almost everything um, yeah, untouched and just used its resources to support the system by a lot more advertisement for the system and also by releasing the system in Europe, which happened in May 1983. And one month later it was also released in Japan thanks to a deal with Bandai. And at that time, Milton Bradley, with the help of Jay Smith and his team from Western Technologies, they had a lot of big plans for the future of the Vectrex. Two devices, which I'm gonna mention in a minute, were also released for the system, but some other plans that they had, two of those ideas actually made it, um, yeah, they, they reached a working prototype status, let's call it like that. The first idea was a keyboard and floppy disk add-on for the Vectrex, which would upgrade the system into a computer system, which was very cool, or would have been very cool. Then the second idea was a successor model of the Vectrex with, uh, with a color screen, since the original Vectrex is only in black and white. And yeah, one prototype was made of this color Vectrex. It wasn't a full color screen or anything, but it was able to display a couple of different colors. And one other idea that I know of, uh, which sadly, um, yeah, never made it into prototype um, status or they never made a, product, a working prototype of this device, but it would have been a touch screen overlay for the monitor. Which would, uh, yeah, which would have been also very cool, but yeah, yeah, not even a prototype was made of this idea. Um, but yeah, at that time, actually, the the Vectrex or uh, everything about the Vectrex looked very good. The the um, the the number of sales and everything looked pretty good. But what nobody um, could have foreseen was the North American video game crash of 1983 and 1984 and the effects that it would have on the video gaming industry. Now I've already talked about the, the North American video game crash in a very long video um, yeah, a couple of years ago, so I'm not gonna uh, repeat or tell the whole story again because it, this would uh, go beyond um, the scope. But what basically happened in this crash or after the crash actually was that in the year 1983 too many video game consoles were competing against each other then home computers like the Commodore 64 were on the rise and they were, uh, they were starting to supersede the video game consoles. And one other thing that led to the video game crash was uh, the market was flooded with uh, video games. And the reason for that was that at the beginning of the 80s making video games was yeah, it was was uh, was a money-making business in the end, and a lot of companies started to produce video games with almost no, uh, almost none, or no experience at all in terms of making video games. And since there was no kind of quality control for the games or anything that could tell the consumers if a game was worth buying or not, like for instance video game magazines. Uh, yeah, a lot of the games that were released at that time were either crap or bad clones of already existing games. 
and this led to a mass of angry and confused uh, customers and in the end they, they stopped buying systems and games and with <clears throat> with sale uh, with sales dropping in the yeah in 1983 the video game industry had no other choice but to react to uh, the, the the drops of numbers in sales and yeah what happened was a lot of new games $60 games were shortly uh, after they were released they um, they would drop the price to 20 10 or even five dollars just uh, so someone would buy the the games uh, the same thing also happened with accessories and with systems the vectrex for instance like i mentioned before when it was released it cost 199 us dollars then in 1983 shortly after milton bradley took over uh, they reduced the price to 150 US dollars. At the end of the year 1983, they dropped the price again to 100 US dollars. And in 1984, they dropped the price to 50 US dollars. And not only Milton Bradley, every company that made video game consoles or games for those consoles uh, lost a lot of money. And only the bigger companies survived the video game crash. Smaller companies either went bankrupt or they were bought by other companies. So it was a very hard time for the video gaming industry. And in 1983, a toy company called Hasbro was actually planning on buying Milton Bradley, which they were looking forward to since they had lost a lot of money with the Vectrex and yeah, they had some financial problems. But one of their conditions was that Milton Bradley must drop the Vectrex first since Hasbro had no intentions on getting into the video gaming business, especially not at that time. Surprisingly, in 1984, Milton Bradley released two accessories for the Vectrex. The first one was a 3D Imager, which were the very first 3D glasses for a video game system worldwide. And the second accessory was a light pen. Both accessories were released in North America, but only the light pen was also released in a few countries in Europe. Then in March of 1984, the Vectrex was discontinued in Europe and in Japan. Then in May 1984, uh, Milton Bradley got bought by Hasbro and a few months later the system was also discontinued in North America. By the time Milton Bradley got bought by Hasbro, it had lost about 32 million dollars with the Vectrex and a few years later I can't tell you uh, in which year it happened all the rights of the Vectrex were returned to Jay Smith and he actually tried to revive slash uh, yeah recreate or whatever <laughs> uh, the, the Vectrex because he was planning on making a handheld version of the Vectrex and releasing the system but those plans were cancelled because Nintendo announced the release of the Nintendo Game Boy handheld system and if I'm not mistaken in 1993 uh, J Smith donated all the rights of the Vectrex into public domain which was the start of a huge homebrewing community and since that day a lot of new games and also accessories like controllers uh, and also a, a new 3D imager was also released a couple of years ago um, then also a lot of um, unfinished prototypes of games and programs were completed slash finished and released by the community and I'm sure there, there will be some more games and accessories also in the future so the Vectrex has today a huge following and a huge homebrewing community and yeah basically this was the entire story of the Vectrex video game system and next we're gonna take a closer look at the system the controller slash accessory and also of some of the games that I have for the system.